let me mention that um, I'll be talking about three books. The Bible is our authority, God's Word. The Book of Confessions, which I'll tell you a little bit about, which is kind of cliff notes on the Bible. And the Book of Order, which is the Constitution of the Church, which is kind of sort of cliff notes on the Book of Confessions. So the Church has three books that are important. This book, of course, is this important. These are kind of here. But if you hear me mention the Book of Order and the Book of Confessions, that's what it's about. Okay, page 12, understanding the church. The church is God's idea. It was created by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is with his disciples up at Caesarea Philippi, and he says to them, who do people say that I am? And, well, some say that you're Jeremiah, and some say you're Elijah, come back, and so on. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So we believe that the church is God's idea, and it's built on faith in Jesus Christ, the rock, uh, Peter's faith in Jesus Christ. So, a few things. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. I mentioned the book of order. That's um, in the preliminary principles of our form of government. It states clearly, all power in heaven and earth is given to Jesus Christ by Almighty God who raised Christ from the dead and set him above all rule and authority, all power and dominion. God has put all things under the lordship of Jesus Christ and made him the head of the church. So the head of the church is Jesus Christ. It's not Mike Loudon. It's not Kenny Ellis. Certainly not Zach Kenny. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, secondly, there are six great ends of the church that are found in the Book of Order. And I like these, and I'll tell you why. They're good for one reason. But I belong, I, I was raised in a, in a tiny little part of the Presbyterian Church family called the United Presbyterian Church of North America. And it, it was mainly in western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and out through the Midwest a little bit. It was a small denomination of about 250,000 members. And in 1958, when I was 10, that denomination merged with the bigger Northern Presbyterian Church. There was a Southern Presbyterian Church and there was a Northern Presbyterian Church. They split at the time of the Civil War. But the bigger Northern Presbyterian Church merged with my little church family, which was called the United Presbyterian Church of North America. And they added to the Book of Order, to their constitution, these uh, six great ends of the church which were from, from the United Presbyterian Church of North America. So I'm like, good, these are my roots. So what's the church all about? It's, it's to be about the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. People come to church, they need to hear that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, that, that he's the way of salvation. Number two, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. You know, we have Christian education programs, we have youth ministries, shelter, nurture, spiritual fellowship of the, of the people of God. The maintenance of divine worship. Very important thing that we do. We have classic worship, we have a communion service early, and we have divine worship service. Then we have Christmas Eve, and Easter sunrise, and, and Holy Week services, and other special services. Maintaining divine worship is extremely important. Number four. Preservation of the truth. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and, and Zach has been talking about that, what we believe, preservation of the truth. Promotion of social righteousness. We also believe the church is to do good things in the world. Talbot House, Lighthouse, Visti, um, various outreaches we do throughout the community and throughout the world. The promotion of social, we belong to the peace organization, which promotes uh, justice ministries in the community. You know. You know, better reading programs for kids in schools and, 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 and uh, affordable health care for those who can't afford it, and stuff like that, social righteousness. And then sixth, the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven in the world. People are look at the church and say, yeah, they're not perfect, but they're trying to, uh, to live for Jesus Christ. So those are the great ends of the church. And 
that's part of what the church is all about. Then there's certain historic principles of church order that we that we hold to. Kenny and Zach and I have been talking recently about, you know, discipling and shepherding and the importance, uh, and Kenny talked to you about this, the importance of, of caring about people and discipling and coming alongside of them and encouraging them to grow in the faith. But there's also a kind of a thin line where you can try to manipulate people too and tell them, now this is exactly how we want you to interpret this and, and how you are. We, we hope that you will all be disciples of Jesus Christ and we come alongside of you and shepherd you and encourage you and so on. But we are not going to tell you, now you have to believe exactly and you have to vote this way or you have to belong to this political party or you're not allowed to belong to this sorority or this fraternity. Right? We don't tell you that. We figure that God alone is Lord of the conscience and that we, we, we may tell you, here's what we think, but we're not going to tell you, this is what you have to do. That's part of historic principles of church order. I mentioned the Book of Confessions. Um, when, for, for years and years and years, we had one basic confession in the church, the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Westminster Longer and Shorter Catechisms, which are question and answers kind of things. And we had that from the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. And when, when I told you, in my little branch of the Presbyterian Church in 1958 merged with the bigger Presbyterian Church, she said, you know, we need to come up with something more modern, like a newer confession. So they set about writing what was called the Confession of 1967, which some of you would sound like ancient history, but trust me, it was modern. And uh, while they were doing that, they said, you know, there's lots of other good confessions. It was like the Heidelberg Catechism and the Second Helvetic Confession from down in Switzerland, and there's Scott's Confession, which predated the Westminster Confession from Scott. And there's the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Let's put them all together into a book of confessions. So that's what they did. And they've added uh, another one since then, which is uh, the, uh, the brief confession uh, from uh, about 1990. So there they are listed, Nicene Creed, Apostles' Creed. Those are ancient confessions. And then there's a bunch of confessions that came from the time of the Reformation, Heidelberg, Helvetic, Westminster. Uh, and then the Barman Declaration is interesting. That's, that's the folks in Germany in the, in the late 1930s, because Hitler was trying to take over the church, the German church. And there were German church people got together and said, uh-uh, Hitler's not Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord. And they wrote this little brief confession, which is pretty powerful, called the Barman Declaration. And then there's the Confession of 67, which was the modern confession when I was a kid. And then there's the brief statement, which is the 1990 confession. I, I, I mentioned that you know the, those two branches of Presbyterian got together in 1958. Well, then in 1983, the Southern Presbyterian Church and the Northern Presbyterian Church, which had split the Civil War, they got back together. And that's when they wrote the brief statement of faith. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ is the provisional demonstration of what God intends for all humanity. The Church is called to be a sign in and for the world of the new reality which God has made available to people in Jesus Christ. Hey, the great news is sin is forgiven. Reconciliation is accomplished through Christ. Dividing walls of hostility uh, are torn down. And uh, we are called to tell and share this good news of salvation uh, with all the world. And we are, as Zach pointed out, to go into all the world and, and make disciples. Uh, now, a little bit of history. When you look at the church, any church, what do you see? People, buildings, programs for kids and youth and adults, philanthropies, missions, councils, committees, 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 yes. committees, <laughs> organizations, institutions. Now, the early church... Uh, as it began to develop, had five major centers. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Antioch, which is kind of in northern Syria, Lebanon, up in that area. And in fact, that was where Christians were first called Christians, Antioch. Alexandria, down in Egypt. Constantinople, up here. Greece, or, or, in, or northern Turkey, right where you cross over to Greece, and Rome. And those areas became the key areas for the church, kind of the key bishops. And then eventually, of course, Jerusalem disappeared because it was 
destroyed and conquered and so on. And the two main areas that developed then were Constantinople and Rome. They became the two uh, chief bishops in the church. Now, after um, the Roman emperor, Constantine, became Christian, or had Christianity become the, uh, the religion of the empire, things began to change, and all of a sudden the church gained a lot of political power and wealth. And so these two bishops became really strong and powerful. And there were some divisions between them, so that in 1058, the Eastern Orthodox churches split away from the Roman Catholic churches. And there were divisions like um, Roman Catholic priests were clean shaven. The Eastern Orthodox priests could go grow beards. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox priests could marry. The Roman Catholic priests, Western Church, could not marry. There was different views on, uh, on the Holy Spirit. So they went their separate ways. And that's why today we have the Greek Orthodox churches, Syrian Orthodox churches, Russian Orthodox churches, all under the Eastern Orthodox family religion. And you have you know, the Roman Catholic Church um, and, and the Bishop of Rome, uh, the, the, the pontiff, the Pope. Well, then you get into the um, 1500s, and there had been some kind of pre-Reformation stuff going on in England with Wycliffe and down in Italy with Savannah and with Jan Hus over in, in Hungary. And that's been going on like in the 13, 1400s. They get to the 1500s, and there's kind of explosion, and people are like, let's get back to the Bible. The church has become too powerful. It's become too wealthy. Uh, you know, we're not we're crazy about some of the things that are going on, some of the fundraising. So we have the Protestants develop. And in, in Germany and Scandinavia, the Protestants basically were Lutheran. Martin Luther was the leader. In uh, England, they became Episcopalians, and the babies were. They became Episcopalians. And uh, really, the reason the Episcopalians broke away was because Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife, and the Pope wouldn't let him, and so he said, well, I'm taking the church out of my country, and we're become Episcopalians. Uh, in France, they were the Huguenots. In Switzerland and Holland, they became what's known as Reformed, following John Calvin. Presbyterians up in Scotland. Anabaptists also developed. They want to rebaptize people, which, by the way, not only did the Catholics not like them, neither did the Presbyterians or the Episcopalians or Lutherans, so the poor Anabaptists nobody liked them. Um, and over time, other groups developed. In England, the Methodists, the Baptists. Uh, in America, the Disciples of Christ, the Pentecostals, and the Mormons, although some would not consider Mormon to be Christian religion. So that's how the church has kind of shaped and developed, and obviously this church is Presbyterian, and it has its roots back in Scotland with the Scottish church, the Church of Scotland, uh, is the Presbyterian church. But to be real honest, you know, 50, 75 years ago, if you were raised a Baptist and you were from Ocala and you moved to Lakeland, you joined a Baptist church. And if you were raised Presbyterian and you moved here, you joined a Presbyterian church. Nowadays, most people come to town, probably 75% of the people, and they say, you know, what, what has a good program for my kids? What has a good program for my teenagers? Where can I worship like I like or, or the, you know, read the Bible and have good preaching? So, you're from Roman Catholic background. What background is your wife from? Uh, she's got Catholic and Presbyterian. Yeah. Now, John, you've been Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. Dutch Reformed. I'm from South Africa. But you're, you're from Dutch? Yeah, Presbyterian is the closest doctrine. Yeah, very, very close to, to that. What about you guys? I was raised Catholic. The Catholic? Catholic. Assemblies of God. You were Assemblies of God, so Pentecostal. So was, so was uh, Kenny. Um, <laughs> Catholic. Roman Catholic? Methodist. 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 And you were Methodist. Methodist. I was always Presbyterian. So you see, we're all different. We're all coming to this church from all kinds of different places. And maybe for different uh, reasons. Okay. Um, a few little things about Protestants and Presbyterians. Uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, there are seven sacraments, <coughs> including marriage and last rites, um, confirmation. Presbyterians only hold to two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And uh, we do that because we think 
Jesus instituted those. So we do them. Not that we have anything against marriage and confirmation, so they're very important, we just don't consider them sacred. Um, there is a church that considers foot washing a sacrament. The churches of God, certain divisions of the churches of God. Because Jesus did say, you know, he washed the disciples' feet. He didn't, didn't commission them to do that. I think he's talking about humility there, but uh, some interpret that as being uh, you should do foot washing. Um, there are three basic types of church government. There's an Episcopal form of government, a Congregational form of government, and a uh, Presbyterian form of government. Now, the Episcopal form of government is what our Roman Catholic and Episcopal friends would follow. And it's a hierarchy with a, a bishop or a pope and then, you know, archbishops and then, you know, district superintendents. And it, it comes that the authority flows from the top down. There's a congregational form of government, and that's more like the Baptists, independent churches, which everything is from the congregation up. And you want any decision, it doesn't come, you don't, you don't go to the bishop and say, hey, what are we going to do about this? You go to the congregation and say, what are we going to do about this? Now, I was pastor when I started out in a congregational church. And if we wanted to spend over, I don't know, 500 bucks or whatever it was, we had to call a congregational meeting. And the moderator of the congregation, you know, we're going to put a new water heater in the church. And somebody moved and second we have a discussion about that. So everything came from the bottom up. And then there's the Presbyterian form of government, and it's kind of like halfway in between. We do elect um, elders locally. Janice's daughter is an elder uh, in our church. We do elect elders. The elders serve on the local board of the church, which is called the session. They then elect people from their group to go to the presbytery. And Presbytery elects people to go to the Synod, to the General Assembly. So we do have a hierarchy, like the Methodists and like the Roman Catholics and so on. But authority doesn't come from the top down. But it doesn't exactly come from the bottom up either, because we have this. It's kind of, ours is a representative form of government. We elect representatives to do our work. The United States government is very, very similar to a Presbyterian style of government. So that's in there. Now, the origins of the Presbyterian Church I mentioned were in Scotland. What happened was the Scottish were ready, ready to do, have their church reformed. They were kind of, you know, oh, we need to do something. And a guy by the name of uh, Calvin, or, or, or Knox, John Knox, a Scotchman, ended up down in Switzerland where John Calvin was teaching. Calvin was this brilliant scholar. You know, if, it's, if, if Martin Luther was the uh, part of the Reformation. Kind of got it all started. Calvin was probably the mind of the Reformation. He's a brilliant scholar. So he has this school of the church down in Geneva, Switzerland. He's teaching. And Knox ends up going down there and studying under him and going, this is really good stuff. And so then he takes it back to Scotland and he goes, hey, here's what I think we ought to do. And so they follow the teachings, interpretation of scripture and so on from, from Calvin. And the church becomes the Presbyterian Church. Well then, a bunch of Scots and Scots-Irish people immigrate to America in the 16 and 1700s. They settle in the Carolinas, they settle in Pennsylvania, they settle along the Appalachians. So if you really want to know where Presbyterians are densest, I can tell you where it's, it's, it's in western Pennsylvania down through western North Carolina. That's that's where Presbyterians are. They're like Charlotte, Pittsburgh. Those are the big centers for Presbyterianism. Um, first Synod is organized in 1707. Um, when, when the Revolutionary War takes place, the King of England says, he calls it a Presbyterian River. So that's a Presbyterian revolt uh, taking place over there. Um, we were one of the big, along with the Episcopalians, uh, we were the big denomination in early America. But things happen. And here's one of the things that happened. America grows and it's growing out to the frontier. Now one of the things that Presbyterians are big about is educated clergy. 
when our seminary, when our clergy to go to seminary. So Kenny comes to us from um, Assemblies of God background and, and then was pastor of a Nazarene and then an independent church. And he comes to us and we said, you'll go to seminary. <laughs> so we send him off to seminary. And um, that's one of the hallmarks of Presbyterianism is educated clergy, but it also got us into trouble as far as church growth is concerned. Because as the frontier grows, and you're growing out into Tennessee, and Kentucky, and churches, and all kinds of revivals and church growths taking place, and the churches are going, hey, we need a pastor. Hey, we send us a preacher. And, and the back to either. When they graduate from Princeton, when they come over from Edinburgh, we'll send them out. And they're like, no, we need a preacher now. So they take the congregations, and they become Baptists or they switch over to Methodists, or they become disciples of Christ. They form a new. So Presbyterians lost our edge because partly of this uh, concept of educated clergy. Uh, that's just one of the issues of why we didn't grow up. Um, I think things became more informal, things became livelier, and we were pretty stuffy Scotsmen, you know, pretty strict. Um, now, I'll talk about this church. This particular church was started in 1885. It was the second church started in the metropolis of Lakeland, which was a tiny burg. And um, you know, Lakeland was basically like the, the Munn Park area. Now, we might have been the second church started. First Methodist was the first church. But we had the first church building. We beat the Methodists on that. <laughs> and just off of Munn, Munn Park on Tennessee Avenue, right around the corner, is there's a jewelry store. What is it? Games Jewelry? I'm trying to think what the name of the jewelry store. And there used to be a Smoothie King in there. I don't know what there is. It's maybe a sandwich shop. Now. That's where our first little church was located, First Presbyterian Church. And it was there um, for a number of years, till 19, let's say in 1907. Oh, by the way, it started as a Northern Presbyterian Church, which is weird. I think there was a, a missionary down here from the northern founding churches. So he started this as a northern church. And then in 1907, it switched and became a southern Presbyterian church. And then, I think by 1919, it had outgrown the little frame building. And they moved over to overlooking Lake Mirror. There's a, we were just talking about this. Um, I had a wedding there yesterday. What is it called? Crager Park, Crager Park. Right across from the Terrace Hotel. There's a park, you know, there's a big swan statue, mm -hmm. right next to the swan statue is where, our, well, it was the Elks Club, and then right next to the Elks Club was our church. So <laughs> that's where we were from like 1919 till 1978. <clears throat> and we had a little square brick building, and then they added a Krishnet building to it. And then there was a fire, and there was a church split. And then they built in 1955 a new sanctuary, which is, you know that um, old 1920s vintage building that used to be a hotel and is now an apartment building called, what is it called? Right there on Lake Mirror, it's yellow, it's right across the Lake Mirror Park. Lake Mirror Park. Lake Mirror Park. <laughs> so that's right there, parking garage, that's where our next sanctuary was. So we were right, that's, that was First Presbyterian Church. And you look at the old pictures of Lakeland, there's a building and a church up there, that was our church. Then in uh, 1977, 78, uh, the church fathers, the, 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 the um, parking lot was, by the way, across the street, and it was a garage. And, uh, you know, people were running, I think some kids got hit maybe by a car running across the street, and the, and the leaders of the church said, yeah, that's it, we've got to move. So they packed up and bought 12 acres on Lake Collingsworth, which is an orange grove, and they built, not this part, but that main part of the building, the sanctuary, the Krishna building. And then in 1999, I arrived, and in 2000, we broke ground for this building. And so that's, that's our facility, and that's where we are. So that's, that's a little real fast review of the Church of Jesus Christ and First Presbyterian Church in particular.